Great to meet everybody. My name is John Seelig. Uh, I'm a highly improbable stand-up comic, as my, my logo says. And I've been doing stand-up comedy for a while now. And before shows or after shows, someone will come up to me and they say, hey, man, I, I recognize you from somewhere. Are, are you an actor? And I'm not. But I, I love, I really love screwing with people. And I tell them that, yeah, I was burned on Sesame Street <laughs> before getting the role of Ross and Monica's dad. <laughs> Two people have watched Friends. That's good. <laughs> We're off to a good start. Good. Uh, so there is, there's a collage of all my roles that I've had, except for Grover. I'm not blue or furry enough to get that one. Um, so what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about presenters and audiences, because I think we need to make that distinction to know what's going on with both of us, the people sitting down, as like you guys right now and me up here, and what's going on through in my head and what's going on in your head, other than um, spreading cream cheese on bagels. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about humor. Why does it matter? So what? Who cares? If you guys, you guys are all kind of in the, the, the IT sales game or the tech sales game, have you ever heard this question, so what? Who cares? Yeah. You have? Oh, yeah. And, and do, you, do you always take that into account whenever you're presenting? Any message you're trying to get across? I'm starting to. Yeah. yeah. The, you know what? I, I, I worked at Oracle for a long time, and uh, that was the question. They used to say, no matter what you're telling someone, so what? Who cares? So we're going to talk about the power of humor and why it matters. I'm going to break down what makes stuff funny. Because really, I'm not here to teach you guys how to run your businesses. I'm not even te here to teach you how to sell. There's going to be a lot of, um, a lot of what I've done is based on some sales training that I've taken through my time at Oracle. Um, but really, jokes, we're going to learn about what makes stuff funny. And then I'm going to present some formulas for those jokes. And then you guys are going to work them into a joke writing workshop later. I'm going to talk about some do's and don'ts in humor. And they may seem really obvious to you. You guys might think you know this. I don't care. I'm putting it all out there. I'm just giving you guys the fine print. You guys can do what you want with it. But at the same time, uh, there are certain things that we can and cannot joke about. Like I said, we're going to do some joke writing. So you guys are going to take the rules, uh, the formulas they've given you. You guys have answered some questions, correct? I, you guys received a questionnaire. You guys answered some questions about your business. Those are going to become the setups and premises to some jokes. And we're going to work on them in our one-on-one -on -one sessions as well. The last thing you're going to learn is that stand-up comedy pays really badly, which is why I've decided to do this kind of stuff. Um, what you won't learn today is how to work a uh, there we go. What you won't learn today, you will not get cool PowerPoint designs. You will also not get magical funny powers. Uh, that's something I cannot bestow upon anybody, is how to become hilarious. However, we all have something in us that I think can be pulled out a little bit and unlock some gates within you guys, within your, where you guys are all really focused on the creative side, I hope, of your business and how to push it forward. But at the same time, we all needed some little creativity to add to our business, to sprinkle it, so that our messaging comes out more powerful, that we're more liked, and that you guys get your message across a little bit better. So if you guys are, who, who views themselves as kind of funny? We've talked. You, you made me laugh a couple of times. So let's, let's say just for argument's sake, Yashin's at a six. After this workshop, I want to get him to a seven or seven and a half out of 10 for being funny. I'm being a little generous, but it's OK. <laughs> um, but if you, guys, if you guys don't think you're funny, let's just, let's just open up some doors some gates within your brain, and let's figure out how to pull a little bit of funny out of you guys so that you can add it to what you guys do. Uh, you will also not get slick presentation techniques. Like, I'm not here to tell you body language is important and how to look at your audience and, and how to articulate and enunciate. I don't do any of that. Sometimes my mother says, you mumble way too much. And I tell her that's just, that's just because you know me a little too well. But, but that's not what this is about. This is really just about how to connect with your audience through humor and, and relate making a, a relatable connection to them, understanding them, so that you can say something funny that makes them laugh that better breaks the ice. Last thing you won't get is that stand-up comedy is a well-paying career. I don't know if I've made that clear. <laughs> I do not know if I've made that clear. All right, so who am I? Who am I? Um, so a bit about me, guys. Uh, uh, I went to school, and, and I got a bachelor's degree in business. The only ones who laughed at that joke were employers. And I wanted to get way funnier, so what did I do? I went right back to school. I got a master's degree in business, and since then, goddamn hilarious. Expected a bigger laugh from the rest of these guys. The, these jokes cost like $60,000 in tuition, everybody. <laughs> so I, uh, I, I, let's, let's summarize. I have two degrees in business, which means like I know, I know a lot. I know a lot about business. Uh, but the fact that I do unpaid stand-up comedy, sometimes in other provinces, means I'm bad at it. So, we're learning a little bit about me. So 
Uh, I do have two business degrees, and after that, I, I went to, to, to work at Oracle for a number of years in both Oracle and an Oracle partner. Received a lot of great sales training there, but I kind of was after maybe nine years of that, I'm like, I really don't want to do this for the rest of my life. Like, I just kind of knew it. I was doing it for a while, and I, that led to a bit of a mid-career crisis. Started doing stand-up comedy and invested a lot of time and energy in something that pays absolutely no money. Uh, but I'm really proud to say that I have a couple of comedy credits. I've done JFL Zoo Fest a couple of times. I've done the Young Guns of Comedy. I was even on The Daily Show. And uh, yeah, I was in a sketch they filmed in Montreal. Do you guys remember the big maple syrup heist that happened? Yeah, yeah they did a sketch where they, f they, they came to Montreal and we were in a restaurant um, and, and they were asking us, what were they asking us? Like they were pretending like we were maple syrup addicts. So for example, I'm eating some waffles and Jason Jones from The Daily Show is like, uh, is like look at you, you're sick. You're twisted, you have a problem. And I'm like, it's just waffles, man. And that ended up on TV. So um, I also have my own social enterprise called Comedy Abroad, where I'm trying to create uh, basically a video content creation agency for the travel and tourism industry by bringing comedians down to popular spots in Latin America. We film our time as travelers and we raise funds with live stand up comedy for people on holiday, for snowbirds, for expats. We raised 23,000 US for eight NGOs in Mexico. Nicaragua, and Costa Rica. It's my elevator pitch. I think it's the best I've ever nailed it. Um, so there's me on The Daily Show. All right, so the stuff we're here for. Finally, I'm kind of talked a lot already. Um, all you guys sell, I would assume, right? So the most common thing I hear from a lot of people when I give this workshop is I'm not in sales, I don't need this. But at the end of the day, and, and you guys know this, we're all in sales, right? Whether it's you're, 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 you're trying to sell someone on why they should invest in you, with a client on why they should invest in your product, or maybe your coworkers on some ideas. Ultimately, we all need to influence each other. People, ideas, budgets, we're, we're all in sales. And this, you guys, are you guys familiar with these guys? This is the ultimate battle. And, and one will represent presenters, and one represents audiences. And I even think right now, I am dealing with this battle. Because you guys are distracted. And not just you guys, but everybody is, is totally distracted, um, and I'll get to that in a second. Who's afraid to present? Is anybody afraid? Um, I guess only if I'm not confident in the material that I present. Bam, that's it. People are afraid because they're scared of the consequences, and usually they're scared of the consequences because they haven't controlled what is controllable. Whereas nervousness, to me, is good. I think if fear is bad, nervousness is great. Nervousness means you care and you've controlled the controllable, you've done all your homework, and the only thing that can throw you off is the unexpected, the things we can't control. And so that's why we're nervous. I mean, this is my own personal view. The other thing presenters want is they want to be liked. Like, I'm hoping you guys, we're spending some time together, I'm really hoping you like me. Please like me. It's very important. So we're all eager to please, and we just want to be loved. Audiences, on the other hand, are distracted. Um, here's, a, here's a simple request. How do I get you guys to turn off your laptops? Is that a possibility? Or is it, or is it like, because I, thi I think that, that's, that's crucial message is we're all distracted. We all have these little entertainment centers in our pockets which are blinging and going off all the time, whether it's your, your text, your email from your coworkers, your customers, your, t your spouse sending you a text, whether it's Tinder, whether it's Snapchat, whether it's Facebook. We're distracted as hell. And nothing is able to hold our attention these days. We have focused attention. Our span of attention for focused attention is eight seconds. I have eight seconds to grab you so that you guys will focus in. People will start to disappear after eight seconds. We have sustained attention spans of about 18 minutes. And does anyone know what 18 minutes represents in the world of speaking? It's really not, but, but uh, let's, a little more specific than that. That's the length of a TED Talk. And there's a reason for that. It's because that's what people can absorb. So we talk about, uh, those two attention spans, you have to overcome both of those. I hope you guys want to be here. Um, because audiences most of the time don't. So if you're ever presenting, I used to present two groups, a group like this. We had the CEO, the CFO, the VP finance, the head of supply chain, the head of sales, and the head of HR. None of them want to be there. I'm presenting, I'm trying to sell, get them to buy an Oracle ERP system. None of them really want to be there. They're in the room because they are paid to be there but everyone's thinking about all those other things that are going on on their phone. So you gotta bear that in mind that no one wants to be there. We all wanna be entertained. Hopefully you guys are enjoying so far. We'll see, I don't know, we'll see how the evaluation form goes. Uh, 
and you guys aren't going to retain much. That's a fact. Everyone will pull away maybe one or two points from that 18 minute uh, presentation. So bear that in mind. Audiences also know when you are afraid. Who goes to watch stand-up comedy? Do you ever go to watch open mic? No. Good move. Don't do it. Just keep your money for the better shows. Um, but, but we know when a presenter is afraid, right? Because we can, we can sense it. They say you can smell fear. Fear can't be smelled. Fear can be seen. It can be heard. And if someone's standing next to a table and there's a glass of water, you can see the water moving. So you got to be careful with that. And our job as presenters is to really overcome all of these, these five challenges. So this is a quote um, that I love. It says, people will forget what you said. People will forget um, what you did. But they will never forget how you made them feel. And this is, this is an important quote from my favorite stand-up comedian of all time, Maya Angelou. She has a great bit on avocado toast. Let me tell you. Does anyone know Maya Angelou? OK. Famous um, African-American poet, okay. female poet. That joke did not hit. All right, cultural reference, not, not gotten. So how do we want to make you guys feel? I want to make you guys feel like you're not at a boring presentation, first and foremost. That sounds so obvious, but it's true because most presentations are boring. Who would, who would agree with that? Let me pull my audience. Let me see if I've tapped into sentiment. You guys are nodding. That's, I'll take that as a sign of approval. You're smiling. I like that. Uh, you want to make them feel like they're glad to be spending time with you, like this is a wise investment of time. George W. Bush got elected twice, regardless of what we think about his politics. Why? Because the average American voter felt that he was the one they wanted to have a beer with. That's so stupid. We're never getting a chance to have a beer with a guy who's a president. But Obama also, he was the more charismatic one. He was the one that people liked more. It didn't even come down to policy. And people, for some reason, like the guy who's in office more now. Sort of, I guess. Electoral college. I don't know how that works. Um, whoop. OK. Uh, what I've learned from my time in sales, as well as from my time in stand-up, is there's a lot of important attributes between the two. Um, and I thought I'd just run this. And it doesn't matter if you're presenting at a large conference, if you're on stage telling five minutes of, of jokes, or I'm up here in front of you. We have to display. Uh, we have to excuse me. We have to display certain attributes so that we can get our point across and that people buy into us. Uh, and this is in no particular order. Um, but I think the first thing you got to do is you got to grab people. When I do stand-up comedy and I'm given five minutes, so sometimes I'll be in, out of town and I'll say, hey, can I get on your show? They don't know me. It's two days before. We're booked, but we got five minutes for you. I want to grab those people as soon as I get out there. I want them to know something about me right away. So I did the Ross and Monica's dad joke and the Burt thing. That always works. So within the first 20 seconds of a stand-up comedy show, I have them. They're on my side. They like me. They laugh. And then I could go different places. And the same goes for whatever point you're making when you're on stage. You need to figure out a way to grab them. Maybe it's not a joke. Maybe it's a graph. Maybe it's a, it's, um, it's a cartoon that someone else has, a video. But either way, you want to get their attention super quick because the phones come out, the laptops pop up, and boom, you're dead. Uh, whatever you do, you need to get the room on the same page. Because that's your time. You want to get the message out to as many people as possible, whether you're, you're telling jokes, you want everyone laughing because you feed off that energy, the same as a presenter. Uh, we got to earn respect. Same as a comedian. Again, that comes back to the confidence and even sales guys or CEOs. If you guys don't show the confidence, they are not going to respect you. They're going to they're just poke holes through you guys. And the same happens to comedians. I watch comedians wilt all the time on stage. And I'm just like, oh boy. And, and there's one guy who had great material. He's around Montreal. He's young. He has great material. But he was just a sad sack up there. And he just didn't look like he was in control of anything. It looked like he was scared, pardon my language, but scared shitless of the audience. And at a certain point, I said to him, I don't know what you're so scared of. You have good jokes. You have good material. Just own it. Just puff your chest out a bit, stand on the lip of the stage, and just act like you own this thing. And he did it. And he did the Young Guns of Comedy, and now he's like a regular at the Comedy Nest in Montreal. Um, I'm a big fan of humility. I'm super self-deprecating up there. I do not take myself seriously in the least. And my least favorite thing, when I worked at Oracle, were sales reps, kind of in the field, who took themselves so seriously. They really drank the Kool-Aid. They believed they had the solution to every multinational's problems because they sold Oracle. They never used the software. They've never implemented it, but they were the experts. And I felt, and they walked in, they had an arrogance in a certain kind of suit, in a certain kind of car that they drove up, but they're dealing with people who run, let's say, a $300 million manufacturing company. So the head of manufacturing probably has been working on the manufacturing floor his whole life, and the vice presidents, too. CEO probably started the company from scratch. 
they come from humble beginnings, these people, and the reps just came in and they're just like, I got this, I got you guys. And they'd sometimes look at them and I'd just be like, oh my God, like this is a culture class. So I feel humility is, is super important whenever you're presenting, getting people to make you realize that you're a person just like them. Um, and to that point, I'm big on self-awareness. Just a show of hands. Who views themselves as a self-aware individual? Who knows, their who knows their strengths, their weaknesses? Oh, that's great. You guys are off to the races. Good. Um, knowing your audience, I never come out and tell certain kinds of jokes. If I think it's a super politically correct, you know, modern day crowd, there's certain things I won't say. And at the same time, if it's kind of an older crowd, there's also jokes I can't do, whether it's Snapchat references or Tinder references. I can't do these because they never use this stuff. So regardless of who you're presenting to, just know your audience. Our tones mean so much. And at the end of the day, I want those people to want to spend more time with me. So comedy shows run, run 85 minutes, let's say, because they want people to come back. They want people to have a good time and come back. If a show goes too long, no one needs to come back. We've had enough. We had our fill. So all of this is, is super critical as, oh no, that's not animated. Great. Oh, and the last point, uh, you want to be, be confident as figs. Those are the most self-assured of all the dried fruit. Just bear that in mind, guys. Next time you bite into one, it'll bite you back. Uh, how humor is going to help? It's going to grab your audience's attention. I mean, this is clear, right? It breaks the ice. It breaks the tension. It humanizes us and makes that connection. Hopefully, again, with the, with the way I look, you guys are like, okay, this guy doesn't take himself too seriously. He's all right. A good joke can also really bring the room together. It unites everybody, uh, much like bagels do. Um, it, can, it, kill, it can reduce tension and stress. Who's worked at a company before? Who's worked at a large company? Where'd you work, if I can? Where? Bank. Yes. CIBC? Google. Okay. California. Okay. Arcare. What's it, sorry, what's it? Yeah, okay, I heard of them. Citigroup. Okay, who's been called into a meeting where they didn't know what the hell was going on? There's like meeting today in the kitchen or the boardroom. Has this happened? And what, what, what do you think's gonna happen? Like, what's, what's, what's going on in your head? Um, some sort of information that maybe on the report. Yeah. Yeah, and how often did that turn out to be true? Right, but you were stressed and everyone was stressed. Everyone's buzzing. What's going on? Are we getting laid off? Is the company going broke? Um, you know, will my dog not be able to, you know, buy his own food tomorrow? I'm just making things up as I go along now. But I always find that a good joke in that moment of tension where people are, where there's some tension in the room, a joke will kill the tension right at the gate, set everyone at ease and then everyone is ready to listen to something all right. Because if it is a really serious time and a bunch of you are about to let go, get let go, I'm not telling a joke. This isn't time for jokes. But once that joke happens, the room chills out and everybody's kind of more excited to be there. And good jokes uh, can prove a point. It's not a joke as much as it is a saying, but I worked in professional services, Oracle Consulting Sales for a long time. Very common pushback was, you guys are $100 an hour, your competitor's 75 bucks an hour. And my boss would say, look, it's not just rate, but it's rate times time. And if you can't afford to do it right, I hope you can afford to do it wrong. And I always thought that was brilliant. It's not funny necessarily, but it pr his expression, whatever he coined, is proving his point. Think it's just so simple and basic, and we'd get the business when we'd use that. So what makes stuff funny? Let's, let's get into some sillier stuff. Surprise! At the end of the day, surprise is ultimately what a good joke is. It's something that's coming out of left field that you didn't see at all. Um, and I, I'm going to give you guys some, a cheat sheet for what, what's that? Sorry, what was that line again that you said? 75 or 100 dollars an hour? Ah, uh, if you can't afford to do it, it's not just rate, but it's rate times time. Rate times time. Right. So someone could quote you, you know, uh, I'll do this for you at 75 bucks an hour, but if it takes them 20 hours to do, but it takes me two hours to do it at 100 bucks an hour, because maybe we have the better expertise. There's a reason why they're cheaper. Uh, and then if you can't afford to do it right, I hope you can afford to do it wrong. So what makes stuff funny is just flat out surprise. Things come out of left field that we don't know. Um, and words are a big part of this. So uh, Yashin and I are gonna give you some, some worksheets after, some cheat sheets, and it'll have some of these rules so you don't have to document them too much. Relatability is funny. Uh, there's a reason why jokes about airplane food and dating you hear those in stand-up comedy clubs a lot, and you don't hear much about machine learning. Um, those aren't things that people can relate to at all. Um, but at the same time, 
you guys each have your own specific audience that you're talking to and that you will be talking to, and that's the purpose of the workshop, is how do we relate to the, to the five people that we're presenting to today? Do you, guys, do you guys ever meet with your customers face to face? Yeah? What percentage of the time are you doing that versus? 100% of the time. You're not doing inside stuff? <coughs> inside, like as in? Over the phone. It's, it is over phone, but I do eventually. Okay, okay. Yourself? Right, okay. 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 Right. <laughs> I think that was the right answer, actually. <laughs> but at the same time, we just want to be relatable to, to whoever we're talking to. Um, and that was the challenge of young guys selling ERP to old veterans, a manufacturing company at banks. They just haven't lived their lives. They're software sales guys. They don't live those day-to-day -day pains. And I always felt that the best salespeople were the ones who really you know, spent the time with their customers, understood them a little better, knew how to relate to them, and had some industry experience. I always felt that those were the ones who did the best. Uh, when we're real. Um, Louis C.K., anyone a fan? Yeah, why is Louis funny? I mean, I just said it, but go. Uh, modern uh, content? He's, he's real, is what I'm trying to say. He strips everything, he strips reality down to the core, and he just presents it to you on a plate. It's naked right there for you, and that, that's why I think he's great, he's not my favorite or anything, but he's authentic, he's real, he doesn't hold anything back about himself or his subject. So our vulnerabilities, and uh, I'm hoping uh, you guys, we, we asked the question about self-awareness, want you guys to think about some of your own vulnerabilities a little bit later. Exaggeration, comedy is about absurdity. Satire makes things absurd and it paints, it paints something real and, and true with a brush of absurdity and exaggeration. And I, uh, at the end of the day, humor is subjective. We all have different senses of humor, so I don't know what you find funny. But these are what most non-entrepreneurs find funny. All right, you guys ready for some formulas? You guys are kind of sciencey types. This is a good one, right? Once I told a chemistry joke, there was no reaction. That was a, sure. That was more reaction than I've ever got in that joke. That's great. I think this is brilliant. It's got a, it's got some really advanced calculus there. It's got like a mouse over a piece of cheese that's squared. I think it's brilliant, guys. All right, that's just me. All right, so what's the makeup of a classic joke? Um, there's a premise. Premise is the subject of your joke. So whether it's uh, eating bagels first thing in the morning, whether it's MacBook Airs, or whether it is um, bags that bagels sit on. I don't know. I don't have anything at this point. Uh, the premise is the subject of our joke. So for you guys, it's usually going to be about your customer's pains, it's about the challenges, the benefits of your solutions. It's about the objections that your customers give you. Uh, a joke is made up of a setup and a punchline. A setup is going to present some information, and it's going to plant some expectations in the listener's head. And then the punchline basically comes along and subverts that expectation. It just reveals a surprise that you didn't see coming. And that's the classic joke. So I'm going to talk to you about how to craft it. Really what we're going to do, this is the hardest joke. I'm starting with the hardest type of joke first because these are the most brilliant ones. And if you can master this, your customers and your prospects will absolutely love you because they'll think you're brilliant. Um, do, you guys, do you guys think stand-up com comedians are smart or do you think we're just up there telling a bunch of jokes about parts of our body? You think we're the smartest people? True and false all at once because we're making very strange career decisions. But, but yeah, I mean, most comedians... Yeah. I'll take it. Yeah, it sounds good. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, but but at the end of the day, um, you know, we're, we're we're that's the hardest joke to create. And so what we're going to do later is we're going to look at some of your statements. You're going to try and list every possible expectation and assumption that someone could make based on what you're saying. And it can go in any direction. It can be about the wordplay, the words that are planted in their head, maybe the meaning of what you're saying. And then we need to figure out how to flip that on its head and subvert it. It's a hard thing to do. And I'd be really impressed if you guys get it. Because this is, even for me, is the hardest kind of joke. Because stand-up has evolved, right, to the point where it's more confessional and storytelling and stuff like that. But jokes are buried into every stand-up act. Stand -ups act. This is the hardest kind of joke. And if, we can, if one of you can get it, I, I will pat myself on the back a number of times. So figure out a totally separate direction versus the one that's obvious. And, and again, when I sit down with you guys, um, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll go through that. 
So here's some examples. Here's the perfect, perfect, perfect example. I got so drunk at last year's office Christmas party, it's okay though, I'm self-employed. <laughs> and I work from home. So clearly, Heidi Foss, who wrote that joke and tells that joke to this day, may or may not have an alcohol problem. I don't know. I, I'm not going to say. No, but she's great. She's actually, uh, she's based out of Montreal. She writes a ton of these kind of jokes. And they're just brilliant. The whole set is just like stuff coming out of left field. Here's another one. I'm writing a book. I have the page numbers done. Now I just have to fill in the rest. It's from Stephen Wright. Do you guys know Stephen Wright? Stephen Wright was big in the 80s and 90s, and he's the master of like these short jokes. There's nothing personal, there's nothing confessional, it's just jokes. Mitch Hedberg, anybody? Yeah, yeah these are Mitch Hedberg kind of jokes. So it's a style, these are jokes. That's, I don't know if I call it stand-up, but it is, these guys are stand-up comedians. Here's one for me. Um, I'm really not a big fan of cultural appropriation. Like for example, I went to a Vietnamese restaurant on the menu, they had General Tao's chicken. I think this is terrible, because I think that only real Chinese restaurants should sell fake Chinese food. <laughs> Gets the biggest laugh, and it's my own joke. I love it. Great, great. I need to work that one more. But the point is, you guys didn't see those coming. You had no clue that it was coming, right? That the, the whole thing about fake Chinese food, real ch okay, okay. Rule of threes. This is an easy kind of joke, and I think this is the one that will, you guys will figure out. No problem. So basically, a rule of threes, a statement is made, and then you're going to list some examples or some attributes, and it's going to create a pattern in the first two. But on the third one that you list, it bucks the, the pattern of the first two. So, for example, I'm not sure what to call this session. Should I call this, funny you should say that, comedic effects, or I was thinking about The Empire Strikes Back. I just think it's got a logo. And uh, people will remember it, right? So it just kind of comes out of left field. So does that, does that make sense to everybody? Am I a good comedy teacher? OK, good. <coughs> Some other common joke formulas. OK, these, I don't write a lot of these. Uh, so I don't know if I have the best examples for them. And I've been looking online for some good ones. And they're just they're hard to find because they're so common. But making an analogy, comparing your product, your solution, your attributes, uh, of your solution to something else is a really good way to make a joke. It's like X is like Y because A, B, and C. And then, of course, the comparison is our solution is more robust than a 1973 Pinot Noir, like that kind of thing. So I just pulled that out of the thin air. That was the first time I ever said that. Great. I have a new one. Um, so you're, you're trying to compare things uh, to one another, and you're trying to find what are the common attributes between these two. So here's one that I wrote, actually. Uh, I, I was delivering, when I started this, I would go to Toastmasters. You guys know Toastmasters? Has everyone done it? No? You have? Well, bottom line is, I've never done it as um, someone who, who, who speaks. But I went and checked out about three of these, because I delivered this, this to them when I was just getting going. And I really recommend it. It's kind of corny at times. And it's very, um, you know, it's like a community, but they're very supportive. And it's, it's a way for you to, uh, it's a chance for you to practice your public speaking skills, both improv, um, humorous topics, as well as um, crafted serious topics. And also to give people critique, they judge you on your body language and your eye contact and your tone of voice. So it's really great if you are looking for, um, to improve a public speaking. So people attend Toastmasters to become better public speakers, but, they're quite good at it. They're like sober people going to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. Like, that was just something I noticed. They're really good at it. Like, why are you guys here? You guys are better presenters than I am. Explaining a joke is like dissecting a frog. You understand it better, but it dies in the process. <laughs> I hope these aren't too dark. I don't know. I think they're all right. <laughs> That's from the famous E.B. White. And so the formula is X is either greater than, smaller than, um, more powerful than, maybe less than. Y, and then you're saying, you know, then Y, then uh, X is greater than a Y or whatever, and then you're explaining why, and the why is the funny. It's the things that they have in common. So we're going to later um, list some things in your, from your, your, your sentences, your statements. We're going to find a list of attributes of these subjects, the actions they take, and figure out if it should be an analogy or if it should be a comparison. You guys can do puns? You guys like puns? That was the right answer. Good. <laughs> I, you guys, you, I'm passing all these guys with flying colors. I hate puns, and comedians uh, totally hate puns, and comedians are crapped upon if we use puns. However, you guys aren't comedians. 
So a pun can go a long way though, uh, if you, especially if you're stuck for a joke and there's something really obvious in your terminology, the nomenclature, um, the full range of dictionary that you guys use when you're presenting the, your language. You never know, a pun can go a long way if it's, if it's done really well. So I'm not discouraging you from it, but don't do it because you will disappoint me greatly. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, use it if you need to, it's, it's all right. So a great example of a pun, let's play on words that have multiple meanings. The grammarian was very logical. He had a lot of comma sense. Wah, 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 wah. But it, like, you know what, it could get a groan. But a groan is a reaction. And a, re and, a, and, that, and a reaction of that kind is better than no reaction at all. Because it means they're listening. And if they're listening, you have their attention. So don't, don't totally shy away from them. And I promise you, you will get some people laughing with a good pun. Uh, a callback. I'm not expecting you guys to do this here, but a call. Does anyone know what a callback is? Does it make sense? Is the uh, callback is when you make reference to uh, you make a joke that makes reference to a joke from earlier in the set. So very often a stand-up comedian will say, "I was at the store and uh, we were buying apple pies," and makes a joke about cinnamon. And later in the set, he makes a totally separate joke about cinnamon and apple pies. And the crowd was like, "Oh, I remember that from seven minutes ago. That's hilarious." So it's kind of like a running gag, which is the next thing I have. Um, I like to make jokes very often about stand-up comics being broke um, because that's, that's just my shtick because I come from the business world. And to me, that's my running gag. So if you guys can figure out a way, maybe throughout, let's say, a half-hour presentation to place the same thing, the recurring theme, all the way to the end and figure out a way to make it better each time, that can go a long way in holding their attention. And my most important rule and formula is practice. And I say this and I repeat this a lot. Because the more you know your stuff for your pitch, for your presentation, um, the more room you're going to have in your mind to branch out and step away from the core message and use your natural sense of humor, your natural improvisational skills to make them laugh and make, just make that connection in general. So the more you practice, whether it's your joke, whether it's your presentation, the more everything will come into your mouth without even thinking. So I've delivered this now for a few months. Uh, when I first started, I didn't have a beat on anything. I was just like getting up there just kind of like doing it, and I didn't, you know, I'm thinking about where are the jokes, where's everything, where are the beats, but after a while, it's just becoming supernatural to do it, and it's like anything, the more we do it, the better it flows. Um, so good jokes will surprise, they're gonna validate, they're really short, that's a, that's a big one. Keep your jokes short, never get wordy, don't do seven sentences of lead up, because people will drift away. Try and keep it to two, maybe three sentences, and short ones. A good joke will reveal uh, uh, the funniest word as the last word in a sentence. So when I did fake Chinese food, that was the last little phrase. And that just, that, that was where the joke turned. Another joke I have is, um, I would like telling people that stand-up comedy is my childhood dream. It's a dream that began like way back in my 37th year of childhood. Like that's, so it's just right at the end, because if you say it right at the front, it, people lose it and if they're laughing, they're not going to hear the rest of what you're saying. Uh, sell your jokes. So it's your body language, your tone. If you need to put a little arm gesture in there, facial gesture, just sell it. Because like I'm a writer at heart. I'm not a performer. I write things and I like, look at it and it's funny and I get up there and the crowd isn't laughing and then I'm like, okay, but this is a funny idea. And then I will tell it to a friend and I'll put some more oomph into it because I know I need to make that one person laugh and then I'll figure out, okay, I need to use a facial gesture or body language, puff my chest out, whatever. And that sells the joke, because people see the confidence. Um, run jokes by friends, by each other, uh, if you ever choose to write them beyond today. So, look, I think natural is better. If you kind of get up there and you're like, hey everyone, I got a joke for you. It's not gonna work, it just isn't. So try and weave it into stuff, and that just comes through practice of both your, your jokes, your timing with the joke, and of course, where you're gonna land it in your presentation, your pitch. Figs now, let's talk about what we're staying away from. Do not make jokes, and this is just gonna be so obvious, so forgive me, I know it seems super elementary school, but I don't care, because people do make mistakes, especially when they're comfortable in their work environment, and they think they know everybody, or with their clients. Uh, coworkers, politics, we live in this hypercharged political environment where even in comedy clubs, it just isn't worth it anymore, to be honest. I mean, unless you're in Canada and you want to make fun of certain politicians, it's fine. But in the States, forget it. 
Uh, do you guys ever travel to the US for work, like to, to, for business? No? OK. Well, you might. And that's just, <laughs> they got a lot of money. They, they, they're going to be your biggest customers. That's just the reality. And it's, uh, I understand what you're saying, but at the same time, you got to mind those people. <coughs> and we got to not offend them too much, because they hold really big bank accounts, some of them, and like our stuff. Well, your stuff. I don't have this kind of stuff. Um, religion, race and ethnicity, um, gender, punching down. Um, do you guys know what that term means? Punching down means don't make fun of a marginalized group in society. So all those first groups of people, religion, race, ethnicity, and gender, used to be marginalized groups. And they still are, to a large degree, um, because we've seen none of this stuff ever goes away. We're better than ever, but let's take some other groups, whether it's the disabled, um, you know, physical, physically disabled or mentally disabled, the disadvantaged in society, that's called punching down if you make a joke at a homeless person's expense. And in comedy clubs, that's not cool anymore. It just isn't. And that's fine with me. I don't care. I don't need to make a joke at a homeless person's expense. It's just not something I need. Politically correct. So a lot of people are railing against political correctness. Um, I think in comedy clubs, it's gone a little bit too far uh, because jokes are jokes, and it is a comedy club, and it's supposed to have be freedom of speech. But at the same time, know your audience. And today's, um, I don't want to use this term, but I'm going to, today's millennials, uh, they're more socially conscious. And they, they, they're not interested in hearing jokes that make fun of marginalized groups. So I've scrubbed those kind of jokes. When I started, that was really cool to do that. When I was uh, watching comedy as a kid, everyone used to punch down. And I learned really quickly, uh-uh, they don't care. They're not buying it. It's not going to allow me to succeed. And there's better things to make jokes about. It's more clever to just do something else. You guys love Taco Tuesdays, right? Everyone loves Taco Tuesdays. I'm going to make a joke about Taco Tuesdays and piss off the whole room, and no one's going to like me. So don't do that. Is really, that's, what, that's my advice there. Don't mock a common sentiment. And you know what they say about jokes that you need to explain? Is that it's not funny if you need to explain it, which is why this joke isn't funny. Good. <laughs> I'm happy. I can go home. Mic drop. OK. What, what, can, what can we talk about? Uh, I think ourselves are the greatest spot uh, to start off your presentation, your pitch, talk about yourself, address something about the way you look, about who you are, your talents, what you're bad at, or your lack of talents. Um, this is the most common place, because if you can be, tell a self-deprecating joke, it gets them on your side, it humanizes you, it does all those things right out of the gate. So I'm a big fan of that. Then, really, um, a lot of the meat of what we're going to talk about is your client's industry, your industry, their pains, their challenges, relate to them, get to know them, make that connection. Current events that are, are benign, non-political, um, pop culture, again, be careful because not everybody knows who Nicki Minaj is. I don't know, I'm just pulling some. I, I barely know who Nicki Minaj is. Um, who's got kids? Anybody? Yeah, so, I mean, a lot of your clients probably have kids. Kids are a great, a great thing to mind. Everyone can relate to them because, hell, we were all once kids. Uh, sports, I think. Uh, and I say that because I think sports are great to make fun of, um, but some people are really sensitive. And uh, I'm from Montreal, and we are very sensitive that Toronto Maple Leafs haven't won a Stanley Cup in 9,000 years. We, we gotta be careful of these kind of things. Yoshin is like, okay, we're never bringing this guy back. Uh, weather, very relatable, it's fine. So when do you wanna make people laugh? You wanna make them up top and in your transitions. So uh, that 18 minute thing, very often when someone's giving a 45 minute presentation at a conference, every 18 minutes you'll notice they, they kind of make a transition. That's a great time for a new joke. Our admitted shortcomings. This has gone flawless, thanks to Stefan, thanks to Yushin, but I've done presentations where that's not working, the, uh, the projector's not working, and the, and the lights are flickering on and off, and something's going wrong, and just call it out. If something's going wrong in your presentation, they're not judging you, because this happens to them too. None of, none of these people that you're gonna present to know how to work a crappy projector. They're not any better than you. So just call it out, make fun of it. It makes you uh, seem human and relatable again. If we're in sales, I want to hear jokes for sales objections. Like the same way that that guy would complain about the rate, have a good answer, have a good joke. It doesn't even have to be hilarious, but let's find something for that. For price, you can bash your competition if you want. At Oracle, they love to teach you to bash SAP. Lots of SAP jokes. I didn't feel that was classy, uh, but Nothing about enterprise software sales for millions of dollars is very classy because everyone wants the deals and the money. So 
They go low. Question, what did you mean by up top? Right, right out of the gate. Oh, okay. Make a joke, have a joke ready for when you start. Within the first, I would say, minute of speaking. How are we doing on time machine? We're pretty good, we're at 940, 950, which are about 20 minutes. Okay, good. So when are we inappropriate, when it's inappropriate, obviously when it's not funny. Uh, and that's why you need to run your stuff by your friends. Hey, would this be good for my audience, for our clients or your coworkers? Say, do you think our clients would like this? Because if it's not funny, you're just, you're, you're digging yourself into a hole. When I bomb with the Ross and Monica's dad joke, I'm in a hole. Because I counted on them liking that. So I don't recommend, I do not recommend jokes for, um, for short, for quick pitches. Like, do you guys ever have to do like a five minute pitch to an investor? I'm not telling you you need a joke for that. I think it's more about your longer pitch. I think it's your sales presentations and that's really what I've designed this for. It's for you speaking at a conference. Um, I would not try and make an investor laugh because if it goes wrong and he looks, he's judging you. Already he's judging you and then you feel it and you gotta dig yourself out of that hole. So I'm not encouraging jokes for short pitches. <coughs> I don't believe in joking if it doesn't add something to the mix. And to that note, don't joke constantly. Uh, you guys are a little younger. Who remembers Fozzie Bear? Nobody? Fozzie Bear was a character, that's me dating myself. But the Muppets came out, the movie came out. Fozzie Bear was the, the comedian on the variety show, The Muppet Show, and he was just always cracking jokes and he wasn't funny. And after everyone's like, oh, Fozzie. But you guys aren't comedians, and, and that's not your job, is to constantly be making people laugh. It's to get them to buy into your message um, and to listen to you and for you to ultimately get them to sign on the dotted line. So don't joke constantly because it'll undermine your credibility. They won't take you seriously. Um, don't make a joke if it damages morale, and that's more of an internal thing when you guys are running uh, companies of 30 to 30,000 people. Um, just watch the morale of your team, because if we crack the wrong jokes, we're gonna lose people. Uh, don't harm, don't single anyone out, never make it personal. <coughs> Who's sarcastic, anyone? Do people get your sarcasm? You get your own sarcasm? You're your own best audience, I love it, I love it. How about yourself? Yeah, okay. Uh, you, okay. Okay. Think. I try to rile people up so they might not always realize that I'm sarcastic until finally it kind of clicks for them. They're like, oh, but, in a, but in a meeting, in a, in a presentation like this, there's no time for them to figure it out, right? Um, my mother, I could be really sarcastic and say, Ma, you look fantastic today, and I'm really happy with the way we're getting along lately. She goes, I'm really happy to hear that. She takes it all at face value. She has no sarcasm filter. And a lot of people don't is what I've learned. So just be careful with it. So how do we get funnier? Right. Who journalizes, who blogs? Yeah? Like with a pen? No. No? That's all right. That's fine. You're getting your thoughts out. You're dumping everything that's going in your mind. It's going on in your mind. You're unloading it on paper, right? That's great fodder for comedy. Like if you can mine that, you could find some stuff in there that you could, things that are bothering you, things that are scaring you, things that you're in love with, things that you're looking forward to. These are all great subjects for comedy and if you blog or journalize, all those thoughts come pouring out and those become, that's how comedians start. We don't just like write jokes in our heads, we mine our thoughts for what could be funny. So that, that's a great thing. Anyone tweet? No? Twi Twitter's a great way to kind of also um, find something funny just get it out there. Just get your thoughts out there a little bit. And maybe it's about your business. Um, maybe it's about something you're passionate about. But all these mediums are great ways for you to express yourselves. So write about, in general, what do you, and this, this could be just a great exercise, what do you and your customers love and hate? Yeah? Well, I'm not talking, um, look, you guys are in business. You guys are trying to cultivate relationships with potential customers and the industry. <laughs> I mean, get your thoughts out there in a meaningful way to them. I'm not telling you to be funny with it. But if you get your thoughts out there, you're expressing yourself. And that's part of what, what this is all about. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, what are your customers' dreams and fears? Know what's keeping them up at night. Because if you can start to relate to those fears and those pains, then you guys are gonna be able to relate to them better and ultimately maybe make them laugh about those fears and pains. Uh, I don't understand anything. You guys, I'm, I'm so impressed by what you guys do. Uh, I understand at a very thin level what, you, what most of you guys do. 
Um, but at the end of the day, I can make a joke about that because you guys are doing what you do, I do what I do, and some people don't understand what the hell I do when I get up there in front of like 80 drunk people and I'm just telling jokes. Like no one gets that. They're like, how do you do that? So make a joke about what you don't understand or what you do understand really well. Uh, what's great about us, what's weird about us, coming back to self-awareness. Uh, so I believe in getting expressive and, and that's why I asked the question about journalizing, blogging, tweeting. These are all great ways um, to capture your funny thoughts and those moments in your lives. Do you guys ever, do you guys ever walk taking, who takes TTC to work? You ever on the TTC and you see something and you're just like, that's ridiculous, right? Jot it down. You're, you're in the kitchen here and someone's spreading butter on their toast a little weird, just write it down. These kind of things, just, just get them. Because if you don't capture them, they're never coming back. You're gonna lose them. They're gonna float away into the ether. You're having a conversation. Like, this isn't a joke yet, but I was in, uh, I was in Boston for a conference a couple weeks ago. Saw this girl with this really gorgeous dog and I said, your dog is really cute. And she says, thank you. And I'm like, I wasn't paying you a compliment. <laughs> you know, like, uh, maybe it's a compliment in your taste, but it's certainly, you didn't have nothing to do with that dog's genetics. So, but I jotted that down, because that was a funny moment, and I just need to figure out what I'm doing with it. Um, but if you can weave those in, it's great. So we all have like notes or uh, Evernote on our phones, great place to capture everything. Or if you really want to be old timey, grab a little notebook and just write, write things down. So journalize, blog, tweet. Uh, I record all my presentations. We got that phone, everyone wave at my phone. This is weird, they can't see you. Um, maybe they see you, Shane. Um, but I record everything, and then I watch it, and then I figure out how can I improve? How can I make myself better? Where did I go wrong? Especially with stand-up comedy, because that's how I know my jokes aren't working. Anyone ever think about doing an open mic? Always wanted to do it. Never What's stopping you? Myself. Yeah, well, it's, are you scared, or you just don't know what to say? Yeah, I, I think, I think uh, it's not like that I'm scared. I think it's just stage fright, because I don't know what to say. Yeah, I mean, you gotta know what you're going up there with. But at the same time, if you have some ideas, don't be afraid. If you just wanna know if something's funny, who cares? Five minutes, some people will not laugh at your jokes. It's hard, I get it, but so what, who cares, move on. No one cares what these people think. But it's a great challenge for you guys to get up there and see if, you, if some of your thoughts can be validated by an audience. I don't do stand-up for attention. I do it because I want to know if my sense of humor and my opinions are valid to people and if it makes sense for them. That, that's the whole reason why I do it. I could do it behind a curtain. You're going to see some comedians who love to act things out and they love to like use their bodies and wave their arms and do accents. Those are just attention seekers in my, in my, in my world, whereas I want to know if my thoughts, my opinions, and my observations are funny and that people connect with them. <coughs> so I recommend doing an open mic. Maybe an improv class. Um, improv is not the same as stand-up. We are mortal enemies. We hate each other. I didn't mean to frighten you guys. Um, but improv, improv is a group of four people usually. They're literally making it up as they go along. They're playing off each other. Uh, it, it, improv is great because it does teach you to think on the fly and be creative and be positive and push things forward. And I think that's a really good skill when you're in a sales presentation or any kind of presentation and you're caught off guard and you need to, to fill a couple of seconds time to collect your thoughts so you can get back to your presentation. But the moment improv as an art form, uh, the moment the performance is over, none of it's ever coming back. It's never gonna, those moments will never get recreated. Whereas a good joke can be reused repeatedly. So when you guys watch stand-up, it looks like they're making it up as they go along, right? Like a good stand-up comic, you're like, they're just, they're just talking, right? That's the illusion of stand-up comedy. But it's really well written, what's that? Memorized, it's still, yeah, yeah. I mean, I need to remember, because I have a terrible memory. But some people, like, they just, they, yeah, they know their spiel. But it's all written, and it's delivered every night. In some cases, it's delivered, certain jokes which come off really naturally, have been delivered every night for the last three years. And if it works, it, there's a reason why they're telling it for that long. It's because it works. So I'm not saying, um, I'm not trying to crap on improv. I think it's a great skill. But it, it's not going to ever guarantee you to connect with your audience. Unless you're just one of those fluid thinkers. I think Toastmasters is great. Uh, and practice. Sneak your jokes into your conversation. Don't tell your, hey, I want to try a joke on you. Just work it into to your customer. Um, maybe not your customer, but, but your coworkers. Try, just figure it out. Um, editing is really key. Keep things short. Eliminate unnecessary words. And this goes for your pitches too. If a word doesn't add anything to what you're saying, ax it. Just shorten, 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 get condensed. People don't want to hear long anymore. 
And ultimately, um, this workshop is designed for some sales teams. So for example, if you guys were all in the sales, same sales team, you'd all be working on the same jokes today uh, as a team. And ultimately, my goal would be for each of you, for, for one joke or two jokes to come out of the whole thing. And it's for everybody to use. So I have that up there. Because ultimately, if, if the joke comes from you and it works, you guys aren't stand-up comedians. You guys can lift material from each other. It's all for the greater good of getting your customers to like you. So if your colleague or your coworker or someone who works for you writes a great joke, hear it, absorb it, make it your own when you, when you tell it to a customer or prospect. Uh, I think watching stand-up is a great way to absorb what these guys are doing and, and watch, watch just their body language. Watch how they sell the jokes because that's what people are buying into. Sometimes, Dane Cook, anybody know Dane Cook? Yeah. Yeah. What'd you think of him as a comedian? Pretty funny. Pretty funny? Yeah. Why? I like his style, it's a lot of storytelling. Okay. It's like it's a little bit uh, over the top. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, what I, I haven't watched much about him, but what I noticed about him was he had no jokes. Right. He just sold. It's just body language and confidence. But he was successful. And, and ultimately, these guys all tell jokes and sell them uh, in a way that I prefer. Each one has their own unique persona. And I recommend checking out, if you like clean and you don't want to hear bad words, watch the guys on the left. Uh, and the people on the right, um, they're a little filthier, but they're, they have something for everybody. I like Bill Burr a lot. There's a reason why he's number one on my list. But it's not, it's not meant to be in any order. I, I like, you know, if you, M David Pride's a guy from Montreal who I really recommend people checking out. He's super smart. If you like smart comedy, he's fantastic. Um, Jim Jeffries is like the Australian Bill Burr. I love Mark Normand. Um, Chappelle's okay. Lou, they're, they're great. I just, they're not my favorites, but, but people like him. So how would you rate um, somebody like, uh, what's his face? Aziz Ansari. I've seen Aziz. I, there's things I like about Aziz and there's things I don't. I don't claim to be an expert on all things comedy, right? But I saw Aziz at the Comedy Works. He was working on material for, I think, what became his book, ultimately. Um, there's a lot about texting and dating and, and that whole thing. This was maybe three and a half years ago already. And I, I watched some of his stuff online. I was like, eh, look, he's not my guy. But then I saw him live and he's, he's naturally, he's just naturally funny. He's just quick. Uh, he uses a lot of words that aren't words. Um, and I liked him. He had a great energy. The only thing I would say is that he arranged the club. He wanted certain demographics sitting in certain places. So it was a little bit not natural. But I liked him. But I don't go out of my way to watch him. Uh, I liked Master Nun's all right. I just don't know anybody like Aziz. And that's something I have a problem relating to him. He's just, I don't know anybody who talks like that. And is that ridiculous, shall we say? Uh, other forms of comedy are great to watch, whether it's sitcoms, movies, interviews. When we hear guys on Conan or uh, on Kimmel, they're reciting jokes. Don't kid yourself. They're not natural, freewheeling. They're, just, they're practicing their jokes. They're just working it in. Cartoons, live <coughs> sketch, and improv. These are other things to watch. and just just. Do you guys like comedy in general? Is this like, because I've actually delivered this and I'm like, who likes comedy? And only two people raise their hands. I'm like, what, is, what do you guys do in your spare time? How do you decompress? So you, you're a comedy person? I wouldn't say I'm a comedy person, but no. You like to laugh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay, of course, okay. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. What's that? Yeah, exactly. There's a lot, there's too much. So what are the big learnings here so far? Let's shout them out. Be expressive, yeah. Practice. Practice, be natural, yeah. Authentic. Authentic. Dan, anything? Um, I guess open with the joke and have it during the uh, speech transition. Okay. Any, any other big ones? You guys, look at that, five already. I've sold five ideas to you guys. That's great. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Be relevant to what we're trying to tell. Yep, yep. No, good. That just tells me you're listening. That's good. So my key message is practice a lot. I don't know why that's last. Uh, and this is just my summary. An early laugh goes a long way. We established that. Recognize where and when to use humor. It's just not always appropriate. So practice, what is it? Like record yourself to practice, or what, what does practice look like? Could mean anything you deem practice to be. But it's a matter of, no, look, it's a matter of knowing our, 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 our spiels, our general spiels, the subject matter that we are trying to deliver. And it's also the joke itself, if we want to put in a joke. And because I'm up here, there's jokes I want, I've been mean to tell you guys, but I, I've forgotten them because I'm just carried away with other stuff. Um, but know where to use them.
just know your script a little bit is really what I'm saying and know how to deliver the joke because if your delivery falls flat, joke could fall flat and again you're in that little hole. But here's a little trick, have a joke in case the joke doesn't work because then you're calling out what happened. Like I have a joke <coughs> where I go, uh, guys what we're learning here is that you don't need two business degrees to, stand -up, to do stand up comedy. All this takes is passion for failure. That's all this really takes guys, that and a bus pass. So. Uh, try and find the funny in your industry. So whoever your clients are, find out what's ridiculous to those people. Like I said, just keep practicing. It's the reason why it's there a lot. Be yourself, be human, don't try to be someone else. Don't try to be anyone that you're not because the best comedians are the most authentic and the most real. Humor is subjective, so that's why I'm telling you run your jokes by your friends. Figure out will someone else like this. And humor can give you a ton of credibility but can also take it. So always just be careful. Any questions before we move to workshoppy stuff? <laughs>